Hello everyone, so now that the Jurassic Fart Project is all done, it's time for some more dinosaur fun. To be more precise, we're going to build a sauropod, or Argentinosaurus, or the Argentinosaurus from Primal, the zombie sauropod. Hello everyone, hope you're all doing well, and thank you for tuning into Moose Motion. Be sure to like the video if you enjoyed the content, comment below what you think, share with your friends, and perhaps consider subscribing if you're new, and be sure you have your post notifications turned on so you don't miss any of the new content. Anyway, thank you for your support, it's highly appreciated. So during this project, obviously, we're going to be building an Argentinosaurus. However, the commentary will be the normal for this channel, I suppose, covering some fun facts about dinosaurs. Now, doing some homework, unfortunately, about Argentinosaurus, well, I kind of discovered there really wasn't a whole lot on them. So to begin this basically small series on how to make a sauropod, I'm going to basically cover sauropods as a whole. Now, don't worry, there's going to be some facts about Argentinosaurus himself in there, obviously, given that fact that he's a fairly popular sauropod, so I've learnt, and well, it's not going to be entirely focused on that, but yeah, just given the fact that there isn't really a whole lot to go off their remains, we can't really, fortunately, give a whole episode, especially one this long, just dedicated to Argentinosaurus. The next one will probably be more, uh, well, perhaps focused on that dinosaur, but I can only imagine that part of the commentary will be focused on it. Now, that seems to be an unfortunate reoccurring theme with a lot of the dinosaur projects on this channel. There just seems to be a lack of, well, either facts or fossil remains on the dinosaurs that I'm making because they seem to be fairly niche, although the Argentinosaurus arguably is probably one of the more popular sauropods in the world. Given the fact that it generally kind of seems to be holding the title of the largest dinosaur that ever walked the earth, so that's a fairly impressive title to behold considering, well, dinosaurs are renowned for their size and the sauropod classes definitely, well, had that one down for sure. Now, any of you who are curious about making your own little sauropod armature doll, there's plenty of text for you to follow along, obviously, so be sure to follow those so you can make your own little stop motion dinosaur projects. Anyway, it's time to nerd out about some sauropods or the largest land animals of all time. They existed for millions of years, coming across the most deadly animals that nature has ever produced. AKA the theropods, like Tyrannosaurus rex, Giganotosaurus, Allosaurus, you get it, the big scary predators. But they survived, and well, they were very successful animals to say the very least. The first sauropods appeared in the early Jurassic. Animals such as Posanosaurus and Tatita nitris were originally thought to be Triassic sauropods, but this was found to be incorrect. <laughs> now, just a quick recap on dinosaur timelines, just in case you're not quite as well subconscious about dinosaur timelines as my nerdy self here. Basically, the order in which the timelines come in is Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And just for a fun Jurassic Park fact here, technically most of the dinosaurs you see in Jurassic Park are from the Cretaceous. Basically, I believe two of the dinosaurs in that entire movie, at least the original on A3 one, are actually from the Jurassic, including your Brachiosaurus and your Dilophosaurus, but that's it. Everything else is from the Cretaceous. Now back to sauropods. They became quickly widespread throughout the planet. By the late Jurassic, famous animals like Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus prowled the Earth. By the late Cretaceous, Titanosaurs took over. Their distribution was near global up until the non-avian dinosaur extinction. Sauropods were herbivorous animals and had long necks so they could basically eat any foliage that they wanted to. When I was growing up, I commonly referred to these dinosaurs as long necks. But as it turns out, that was apparently possibly a adaptation for, well, obtaining their rather large size, and I'll get to that right away here. The theory being, basically, the larger you get, the more energy it takes to actually move around. So, basically, the idea behind having a longer neck means you can basically stand in one place, moving your neck around, eating as much as you can within that general vicinity, therefore saving as much energy as possible, growing as much as you can. They were all quadrupeds and had relatively small heads. Now, fun fact about their preservation, unfortunately, generally speaking, the skull is the one thing that's almost always missing on these sauropods. Their bodies were rather massive and had fairly long tails to boot. And their legs were long, straight, and rather powerful. Obviously had to be in order to hold all that weight up. One of the most defining characteristics of this group was their overall size. 
The largest sauropods were even larger than nearly any other animal on Earth besides massive whales. Their body structure did not vary much between genera, but the one difference that could be found was overall length. Some sauropods like Diplodocus had extremely long tails. So long, in fact, that some scientists think that they could have used their tails like whips. Supersaurus at 34 meters or 112 feet is the longest known sauropod from reasonably complete remains. Argentinosaurus is longer at 36 meters or 118 feet, but the fossil material was less complete. It's thought it could have gotten much longer though. Marapunosaurus may have been 58 meters long or 190 feet long. If true, its vertebral column would have been much longer than a blue whale. To put these animals' length in perspective, the longest living terrestrial animal today is the reticulated python at 6.95 meters or 22.8 feet. On a personal side note, I generally love animals. I kind of have a small petting zoo at home here. And, well, uh, the thoughts of a 22-foot-long snake just has nope written all over it. Just no. No, 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 no. However, I mean, sauropods obviously dwarf this thing, but a uh, uh, sauropod's probably not nearly as entitled to swallow me whole after crushing me. So, yeah, I'm just not a huge fan of pythons. They scare me a little bit. Speaking of pythons, though, there was technically one in the prehistoric times that was much larger than any of the ones that got to today's sanders and eight dinosaurs, but that's a discussion for another time. Some sauropods were extremely tall. Brachiosaurs had very tall shoulders and extremely long necks. Sauroposeidon was probably the tallest of all at 18 meters or 60 feet tall. By comparison, the tallest giraffes are 5.5 meters or 18 feet tall. Of course, with great length comes with great weight. The most complete evidence tells us sauropods could weigh up to 80 metric tons or possibly more. Argentinosaurus was among the most massive of all the sauropods. Some estimations put it at 99 tons, but these may be overestimations. A quick Google search tells me 50,000 to 100,000 kilograms, so either way, this thing is definitely not on the light side. There is poor evidence. Bryathocathosaurus may have weighed up to 75 metric tons, but this has been heavily criticized. The weight of Morapunosaurus was estimated to be 122 metric tons, but critics claim these estimations were widely exaggerated. It also should be noted that these estimations are very hard for sauropods because, well, a lot of the time there isn't a lot of fossil evidence to, well, base these weight estimations off of, unfortunately. For example, Argentinosaurus is a well-known one, but it doesn't really have a whole lot of fossil evidence backing a lot of these weight claims up either, given the fact that basically the remains that we have are only about 3.5% complete. It would appear what we do have essentially is part of the spinal column, some of the rear legs, and a bit of the hips. Now, given the fact that we do have the rear legs of this thing, you probably can get a little bit better weight estimation, but it would be obviously more accurate to have probably all four. That being said, the complete preservation of these sauropods is extremely rare, unfortunately, which, I mean, kind of seems surprising at the beginning, but if you really think about it, it's hard to become a fossil as is. Now you're talking about an animal that potentially weighs hundreds of tons. Now the amount of sediment and preservation that it's going to take to, well, fossilize this animal is, well, immense to say the very least. So it's going to be hard to say whether we're going to ever actually have some very complete Argentinosaurus or various other sauropod skeletons at some point. One can only hope. From current evidence, it's not too unreasonable to believe that some of these sauropods could have gotten up to 100 metric tons. Kind of crazy to think about how heavy that actually is. The largest blue whales get up to 190 metric tons and some only get to about 50 metric tons. And seeing how we're on the topic of, well, aquatic animals, when scientists first discovered sauropods, they assumed that these animals had to be semi-aquatic due to their large size. And you can see lots of old paleo art representing a lot of, well, these sauropods hanging out in swamps, essentially because it was thought that they were too heavy to basically walk on land. And I vaguely remember actually seeing perhaps a few of these books as a child, to be honest. At least with that common you know, complexion of the sauropod in the swamp at the very least. 
Now, obviously, with modern day research, debunking this, well, very awkward thing for the sauropods to be doing in the first place, not that they obviously couldn't swim or hang out in the water, but it's been apparently proven that if they were fully submerged in water for probably a period of time, their lungs would likely collapse. Then this image of sauropods hanging out in the water regularly was even further debunked with the discovery of air sacs in their skeletons. Now, obviously, they would have probably floated away at this point, although part of me loves the image of a sauropod trying to hang out in the water for an extended period of time and just going floating away. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be hilarious. Maybe I should animate that. I could just see it as he floats off in the distance. Ah, the scientist told me I was supposed to be here. Anyway, that's a future stop motion project. All jokes aside, sauropods were more than likely capable of swimming, but were not well adapted to well locomotion in the water, obviously. And one crazy thing to think about, these things were probably more than capable of crossing rivers without even getting their torsos wet, so why bother swimming? Sauropods have a system of air sacs running through their vertebrae, and more precisely, their necks, to help reduce weight. And they also had hollow bones, which has led some paleontologists to mistaken them for pterosaurs, apparently. A sauropod's main defense was its overall size. Once fully grown, I would imagine that their size alone would have been more than enough to deter most predators. Although, that being said, I'm sure there would have been more than likely their fair share of, well, encounters, even at full size. Because there were some pretty big theropods back then, and there's been, well, some fossil evidence of these things being munched on, so... Yeah. Their young were definitely susceptible to predation, though, that's for sure, because obviously you have, well, some time to grow, and it's unclear as to whether or not sauropods did provide parental care, because from what I've seen in most documentaries, the common, uh, you know, image for these things is they lay a large amount of eggs and just kind of hope for the best and survival of the fittest. However, that all being said, we can only speculate because, well, these animals have been, well, dead for millions of years, and we can only kind of, well, take rough estimations as to what their life was actually like, unfortunately. Which is, well, probably part of the reason we find them so fascinating. Or at least part of the reason I personally find them fascinating, because, well, there are so many stories and some of them will just unfortunately never really know at any rate, what do you find fascinating about dinosaurs? Leave a comment in the comment section below and let me know what you find, well, most interesting about these prehistoric animals. At any rate, it's time for the build rundown. So this skeleton was far more detailed than most of my usual stop motion projects when it comes to making the skeletons, which is why I'm a little behind schedule and I do apologize, but that's unfortunately kind of the normal because I have a bad habit of biting off more than I can chew. And that definitely happened, well, because of this sauropod size project. I was originally just going to do a, well, normal Argentinosaurus, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I came across Primal recently and was heavily influenced by their zombie Argentinosaurus, or the Argentinosaurus infected by the Plague of Madness, as it's referred to. And I just thought that looked way too cool, so I had to make a claymation version of this because, well, the skin melting off, especially with all the boiling effect that claymation can have, this will definitely be a fun animation project for the future. Now, with zombie-like characters, unfortunately, that means you basically got to do an entire skeleton because it's probably going to be visible more than one occasion. So that generally means your sculpture is going to take a little bit more time than usual. Hello everyone, so during this video today we'll be covering this Argentinosaurus skeleton with clay, one could say, and we'll be learning some fun facts about this dinosaur along the way. Although you could say this dinosaur isn't entirely scientifically accurate anyway. Welcome to part 2 of the Zombie Dinosaur Project, or the Argentinosaurus from Primal. So to start this video off, I'm gonna do some painting, you could say. It's easier to get that out of the way before the sculpting takes place, you could say. Now, obviously, during part one, we built the skeleton. Now, during part two, I'll be adding a lot of plasticine clay, you could say, and basically building up the layers of muscle today. I was hoping to have this project done, you could say, but unfortunately, life had some delays. Because normally, I don't break down my dinosaur projects into, well, three parts, but unfortunately, with this one, I think I'm gonna try and make that maybe the new normal, because generally, I find usually part one is kind of easy, and then part two is kind of like, a, oh my god, I need to just get all of this done add feathers and details 
it generally just kind of ends up being a lot more stressful than it is fun at that point. So for my sake, we're probably going to try and make that the new normal is break it down into three parts. Therefore, give me a little bit more time to, well, actually make these dinosaurs and perhaps get a little bit more sleep because that would be nice because that sleep schedule has definitely gone down the drain since I've started this, well, YouTube thing. However, I must admit we have definitely picked up quite a few new subscribers as of lately and I can't thank you all enough. It's quite nice to actually get some notoriety for all this hard work finally. And if you do appreciate all the hard work that goes into these sculptures, as well as the commentary, which I should probably get into the fun facts about this dinosaur pretty quick here, because I've been ranting on a little too long, I think, you could let me know just by hitting the like button below. So last time, in part 1, during the commentary, I covered, well, sauropods as a whole, because I was having a tough time actually finding, well, some fun facts about Argentinosaurus itself. However, I have some good news. I was able to actually find quite a lot actually on Argentinosaurus at this point. So without further delay, let's dive into the fun facts about this massive sauropod. Argentinosaurus lived during the late Cretaceous period, 92 to 100 million years ago in South Argentina. Sadly, it's only known from fragmentary remains, although it's thought to be one of the largest animals that has ever walked the earth or perhaps even the largest. With size estimations ranging from 50 to 100,000 kilograms, or 88 to 110 short tons, at 30 to 40 meters long, or 120 feet, at 70 feet tall, or 21.4 meters, it's pretty easy to understand why some people assume this thing is the largest animal that has ever walked the earth. It was a member of Typosauria, which was the dominant group of sauropods during the late Cretaceous. Although, sadly, the genus is only known from currently one species at the moment. Known as Argentinosaurus huoncolensis, otherwise known as Argentinosaurus, which I will probably only refer to as because I don't really feel like saying that mouthful the entire time, unfortunately. But cool fact that basically Huoncolensis, part of the name, is basically dedicated to the region in which it was found. The basic name Argentinosaurus means Argentine lizard. Argentinosaurus is among the largest known land animals. However, it's hard to get an accurate estimation due to the fact it's known by fragmentary remains only with 3.5% of the whole skeleton. To counter this, scientists can compare other known material from other smaller related sauropods known for more complete remains. The more complete taxon can then be scaled up to match the dimensions of Argentinosaurus. Mass can then be estimated known using relations between certain bone measurements, and body mass can also be estimated through the use of models. To put this into perspective, the average blue whale is probably about the same length as the Argentinosaurus. However, the mass of the whale is larger due to the fact, well, it doesn't really have to deal with gravity because it lives in water. It's possible Argentinosaurus was the largest dinosaur that ever existed. However, there might be a longer known sauropod called the Supersaurus. Its estimations are more accurate between 39 and 40 meters long. However, Argentinosaurus was definitely heavier because Supersaurus estimated to be 31 to 36 tons. Argentinosaurus was first found in 1987 by Guillermo Heredia. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right and didn't butcher that, but apparently he's a rancher from Argentina and was looking for petrified wood when he came across the Argentinosaurus. I guess that was a pleasant surprise. In 1989, a larger dig was initiated, and multiple vertebrae and damaged pelvis bones were discovered, resulting in the holotype specimen of Argentinosaurus. In 1996, scientists found a femur bone in the same location as the holotype, however, the bone was deformed during fossilization. And in 2004, a femur bone was assigned to the genus, however, it only preserved the shaft of the bone. It should probably be mentioned, as of today, it's hard to know if any of these femora actually do belong to Argentinosaurus, though. Argentinosaurus likely possessed 10 dorsal vertebrae like other titanosaurs. The vertebrae was even massive for sauropods. One dorsal vertebrae had a reconstructed height of 159 centimeters and a width of 129 centimeters. To put this into perspective, a single vertebrae was taller than an average bear. The vertebrae were eternally lightened by a complex pattern of numerous air-filled chambers. For example, both the dorsal and segral vertebrae had large cavities, measuring 4 to 6 centimeters in diameter. The dorsal ribs were tubular and cylindrical in shape in contrast with other titanosaurs and possibly hollow. It is also possible that this is due to erosion after death to the individual. 
The giant size of Argentinosaurus and other sauropods was likely made possible by other contributing factors. This includes fast and energy efficient feeding allowed by the long neck and lack of mastication. That means they didn't chew their food. Fast growth and fast population recovery due to their many small offspring. And advantages of giant size would likely include the ability to keep food in the digestive tracts for lengthy periods of time, extracting the maximum amount of energy, as well as increased protection from predators. Argentinosaurus, just like every other sauropod, was oviparous, meaning females laid eggs. The size of the dinosaur would suggest proportionally large eggs, however, that is not the case. Eggs of Argentinosaurus were 1 liter in volume, which is smaller than your average ostrich egg, which is 1.6 liters. Freshly hatched Argentinosaurus would have been no larger than 1 meter, and no heavier than 5 kilograms, possibly fox-sized. However, just like every other sauropod, they increased their size by 5 orders of magnitude after hatching, meaning they would grow 100 times larger in a short span of time. As they grew larger and older, this rate would slow down, but is still one of the fastest growth rates of any animal. As the size of Argentinosaurus probably scared a lot of the potential predators away, even it was not safe from them. The small size of the hatchlings meant they were prey for many different predators. As they grew larger, the number of potential threats reduced, but even the fully grown adults were not entirely safe from them. It's possible Argentinosaurus were preyed on by Mapusaurs, which is among the largest theropods known. It was 12 meters long and weighed up to 3 to 5 tons. It's known from at least 7 individuals found together. Which leaves the open possibility it being a pack hunter. Which, well, makes them more than capable of taking down, well, large individuals. Such as a fully grown Argentinosaurus. A little disclosure here, I've never actually heard of the Mapusaurus, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, up until recently, up, well, till this video actually. And the thought of, well, seven theropods that are three to five tons hunting all together in a pack is just honestly terrifying and i'm gonna have to do some homework on those dinosaurs because that sounds scary and really cool and that concludes our argentinosaurus part two project build at least for now this zombie dinosaur is nearly complete so it's time for the build rundown so we started off this video by painting and getting in those hard to reach places there will be a bit of that in part three but that'll be for the fine details and there was quite a bit of sculpting with clay you could say where we basically got the main shape out of the way which included most of the muscular well structure of this dinosaur in particular as well as well a mixture of different colors along with the two-tone design and well his rather gross rotting tail which I had to do some custom colors on which generally I do not recommend doing because well it's extremely hard to duplicate the color a second time and there are professional studios that will just outright avoid that process altogether however I just didn't have a color that matched it properly for the primal design and one thing I will have to touch up next time is this side doesn't look very well bulky in comparison to the other so I'm gonna have to add a little bit more clay for next time but we're also going to be taking quite a bit of layers off and well exposing some of that skeleton once Hello, again. Hello everyone and welcome to part three of the Argentinosaurus stop motion project where during this video we'll be learning some fun facts about these types of dinosaurs as well as finishing this zombie project off. Hello everyone, hope you're all doing well, and thank you for tuning into Moose Motion. Be sure to like the video if you enjoyed the content, comment below what you think, share with your friends, and perhaps consider subscribing if you're new, and be sure you have your post notifications turned on so you don't miss any of the new content. Anyway, thank you for your support, it's highly appreciated. <laughs> So during part 3 here, I'll obviously be adding in a lot of the fine details of this sculpture, adding clay, and, well, oddly taking it away as needed for, well, special details. Given that this is the Mad Sauropod from Primal, it's probably one of the rare situations where I'm probably taking away just as much clay as I'm adding it to add in details. Given that this character is essentially melting away, it's going to be quite well a process during the animation to make that all work. However, I think it's going to be quite cool in the end seeing it all kind of come together in a 3D platform as opposed to 2D. It'll definitely be interesting, so I'm definitely looking forward to test animations with this character. 
But as I sculpt away on this dinosaur today, we'll be learning some fun facts along the way. Covering a few things about the Argentinosaurus, you might say, that I didn't have time for in part 2, unfortunately. Where during that video, obviously, we took quite a deep dive into Argentinosaurus itself. This time, well, I don't nearly have as much facts on this dinosaur as I did last time, so we'll probably be covering dinosaurs as a whole, and how they got so large primarily. So without further ado, let's get into some fun facts about the Argentinosaurus, and perhaps the heavily nerdy portion of this video. Now to help put this dinosaur into perspective, this thing was taller than a six-story building and longer than three school buses and 10 times as heavy as a elephant and apparently just one of its legs alone was taller than a three-story building that's taller than my house that's just crazy however it is also crazy to think about how much food this thing would have had to eat to survive approximately 850 kilograms a day approximately a hundred thousand calories the neck had approximately 14 vertebrae, allowing it to reach the top end of trees with ease. Now obviously the proportions of this dinosaur are rather large, however I found one part fairly interesting, or one organ particularly interesting about this dinosaur. The heart of Argentinosaurus was massive, approximately weighing 1,100 pounds. To pump blood through its body, it probably had a four-chamber heart, much like birds and mammals today. This would help maintain its large body size and live a active lifestyle. It's also estimated the hearts would have had to have pumped blood up to 12 meters every 50 to 60 times a minute. Even the footprints left behind of Argentinosaurus were massive, measuring over 3 feet in diameter. Which is kind of crazy, because that's literally half my height. Now, as a mammal that's approximately 2 meters tall, honestly, it's a little hard for me to wrap my head around these creatures walking around as tall or taller than 5-story buildings. But yet, they existed from the Jurassic to the Cretaceous period when our ancestors were the size of bulls and shrews. Dinosaurs like Supersaurus, Saur Poseidon, and Argentinosaurus were shaking the earth. So you might find yourself asking, why did dinosaurs get so big and why did mammals never even come close to dinosaur size? Well, to our credit, the largest animal ever to exist is the blue whale. It can get up to 30 meters long and weighs up to 145 metric tons, which is two times heavier than the world's largest dinosaur. But to be fair, the biomechanics are a bit different in water. Buoyancy and blubber can do amazing things, allowing sea creatures to achieve sizes that would be impossible on land. When it comes to largest terrestrial animals, mammals were never any competition for the non-avian dinosaurs. Now, there's always been some debate over which the largest dinosaur actually was. But the current record holder for the largest specimen belongs to a sauropod or a titanosaur named Patico Titan. Experts estimate that this Cretaceous herbivore stretched 36.5 meters and weighed 64 metric tons. By contrast, the biggest mammal to walk on land, the hornless rhinoceros known as Paraceratherium, it weighed a mere 15 tons and stood about 5 meters tall at the shoulders. Roaming from Eurasia, Romania to China at the end of the Oligocene Epoch, long after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. So how can two subsuccessful animals end up having such different size constraints? Part of it has to do with how they reproduce. Parceratherium was a placental mammal like us, meaning they gestated their babies inside their bodies. And if this ancient rhino was like anything large we have today, this means this would have taken a very long time. Big mammals like giraffes and elephants usually have one offspring at a time, and gestation can last longer than some other types of animals live. Elephants, for example, carry their babies for more than two years. Now consider the dinosaurs. They didn't really have to carry their babies at all because dinosaurs laid eggs. Even the biggest of the giant dinosaurs hatched from an egg no bigger than a soccer ball. What does this have to do with size? Well, bigger mammal species give birth to bigger young, which requires a huge amount of energy and time to gestate. Dinosaurs, on the other hand, totally bypass this problem. Instead of having bigger babies, the largest dinosaurs laid relatively small eggs, producing relatively small hatchlings. Reproducing this way, with babies hatching and growing outside of the mother's body, removes the size limit that gestation places on mammals. Dinosaurs had another evolutionary advantage, their skeletons had special features that mammals lack. A sophisticated system of air sacs. 
These sacs were pockets of soft tissue that were connected to the lungs, thinking of them of biological balloons. Some of these sacs sat in the body cavities of the bones, usually in the neck, back, and hips. But others ran inside the bones themselves. These air sacs helped shape the dinosaur's skeleton and allowed the bones of the biggest dinosaurs to remain light without sacrificing strength. How do we know extinct dinosaurs had these sacs? Because non-extinct dinosaurs have them too. Birds have similar system of sacs that help draw air into their lungs and keep their skeletons light. And if you compare the respiratory system of birds to the one of giant dinosaurs, you will see the resemblance is pretty striking. Like big sauropods, for example, the vertebrae in the back of the neck have similar pockets and divots as birds of today, where these air sacs would be attached. And when paleontologists scan some fossils of dinosaur bones, they often find hollow spaces inside the bones where these air sacs used to sit. Now keep in mind, bones of spaces created by air sacs are different from hollow bones you see in the legs of birds and other theropod dinosaurs. And not all of these extinct dinosaurs had these handy airbags either. Only the type of dinosaur known as the Slorishians had them. In the traditional dinosaur family tree, this group encompasses the theropod two-legged dinosaurs, including birds of today, and the sauropods, the quadrupeds that include the giant titanosaurs. All of the rest of the dinosaurs, like the horned, armored, duck-billed dinosaurs, are known as ornithischians. And they didn't have these features, so they weren't as light on their feet. And of course, we mammals obviously don't have any of these features. We retained a skeletal structure of dense, heavy bones that put a limit on how big we can get before our bones crack under our own weight. But these adaptations are just what allowed these dinosaurs to get so big. They don't tell us why these giants got so massive in the first place. And that's a totally different evolutionary question with lots of possible answers. Maybe living large was a way to stay safe from predators. Maybe their size allowed them to cover more ground and reach higher leafy branches in search of food. Or maybe something paleontologists haven't thought of yet. And then there's another question to consider. Was the ability to grow so large really an advantage? After all, all the sauropods are gone now, and almost all the relatives. After all, of all the entire species of dinosaurs, only the birds, a single group of Cilician theropods, have survived. And they range from sizes to the hummingbird to the ostrich. So today, if it's hard for us to picture a dinosaur as huge as Patago Titan or Argentinosaurus, we can at least understand how animals like this were physically possible. Perhaps we are lucky we haven't reached such giant heights. After all, it would seem, evolutionarily speaking, bigger is not always better. And I personally find it quite fascinating how, well, animals such as this size were ever even physically possible. I personally don't think I'm ever going to be able to get my head around it as, well, the Argentinosaurus head comes off here. Now this project is nearly coming to a close, seeing how I'm on the face, it's generally one of the last things I like to sculpt, because it usually has a lot of fine details that are generally a lot easier to just not have to work around while you're sculpting the rest of your project. Now one thing I should probably mention, just in case there is some major dinosaur nerds ever watching this content, the nose obviously is quite incorrect that I'm going to be sculpting here, mainly because, well, this is a cartoon character from Primal, so I decided to stay true to the character design there, and not really maintain the scientifically accurate portions that I generally like to stick to. Now, back in the day, or like early 2000s, uh, 90s, I would say, it was a common image for Brachiosaurus in particular, mainly because of Jurassic Park, to have the nostrils placed up on top of that crest. However, it's apparently been discovered that basically that crest was like the bridge of the nose, and their nostrils probably would have extended straight forward to the front of their face. So, sauropods would have had a very, very big nose a lot of the time. Just figured I would cram in that one last fun fact, while also correcting my sculpture here. Well, maybe not so much correcting, or more or less justifying. Now, one thing I should admit, this project was definitely a lot more work than I expected it to be, especially the face here. I remember kind of doing this on Sunday, being fairly confident, going, oh, this will be easy, I can usually finish the face fairly quick. However, I underestimated, well, all the rotten details, pun intended. So that's why I'm a little behind schedule as per, well, usual. And as far as my sleep schedule has been concerned, well, breaking it down into three parts hasn't really helped that much either, unfortunately. Mainly because, well, the commentary takes a lot longer on these dinosaurs, and, well, I picked a fairly difficult project this time around. So, 
Be sure to smash that like button if you enjoyed the content. That definitely means a lot to me. It you know, helps the channel grow, obviously, too. And if you're new, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of the new dinosaur content that will be coming up. I kind of have some itching for some stop-motion animation because I haven't done one for a little bit. The Jurassic Fart Project was my last one, so that would be a good one for you to check out if you're new here. And, well, the next how-to project will be a Triceratops. So I'm definitely looking forward to making that three-horned lizard. So that should definitely be a lot of fun. So be sure to comment below what you think of the project and, well, subscribe if you're new. Now, as I finish up the last remaining details on the face here for our, well, poor infected sauropod in this case because, well, the Plague of Madness has definitely taken over him more than some people are probably comfortable with. So, yeah, he, he's not exactly the prettiest dinosaur in my collection, to say the least. But I think he's personally pretty cool. And, well, maybe I'll make some more zombie dinosaurs in the future, because this project actually did do fairly well overall, and, well, we'll see how the animation processing go. At any rate, I'm going to leave you guys now to the beauty shots. So, hope you enjoyed the video, and I will see you at the end. Hey, you made it this far in the video, be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed the content, comment below what you think, share with your friends, and perhaps consider subscribing if you're new. Anyway, that's enough from me, Till next time, take it easy.